associate professor at the Niels Bohr Institute and participating scientist in the program Phoenix that proved the existence of water on planet Mars. He is also a participating scientist in the program Curiosity, the land rover that is finding out what is going on on the surface of planet Mars. So if you have been wondering since you were born, if your mother or if you yourself have come or have been born in planet Mars, then you should ask that question to Morton Bomason. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's lecture will be followed by a pleasant surprise. Andreas Bennetson, bassist and music composer, and Michael Hexen composer and musician will perform tonight the sound of an orange. I repeat, the sound of an orange. This digression over the findings on the surface of Mars will be reinterpreted by the artist Henrik Schultzen. Applause to Professor Martin Bumatz. Come, it was almost in Martin. I hope you understood it. And I hope you will be able to understand some of what I'm going to tell you. Nowhere is as beautiful as Earth, but I hope I can convince you that uh, at least Mars is uh, somewhere very beautiful. It is to me, at least. <laughs> uh, I work on Mars, and I'm not alone. This is my Danish team, and we are about 500 uh, international colleagues, uh, many scientists and some engineers, uh, to make this machine run. Just to tell you where we are, uh, this is the third rock from the Sun. This is the Sun, and this is Earth. This is the fourth rock from the Sun. This is the orbit of Mars. And uh, you probably all know that the distance, the light time from Sun to Earth is about eight minutes. Uh, Mars is out here, it has a slightly elliptic orbit. It uh, moves a little bit slowly, so the uh, Mar Martian year is uh, 668 Martian days. And the Martian day is a little bit longer, 35 minutes longer than the Earth day. Uh, so I have a watch that's 2% two and a half percent slower than the one on, on Earth. <laughs> so, uh, usually when you work on Mars on solar cells, you need to work on Mars time. <laughs> and this is what it's all about. This is how Earth formed initially, uh, from a cloud of dust that collapsed. And uh, Earth was warm initially, a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of uh, uh, gravitational heat. So there was a lot of volcanoes, and after some time, we had water, a sea formed on the surface of, of uh, the Earth. And for all we know, something similar happened on Mars a very long time ago. And if we continue here, the, there are molecules in this sea, and they develop to something that crawls onto land and uh, makes telescopes and look back on itself. <laughs> that has not ha happened on Mars, we believe. Uh, but we'll see what you think. But the reason, the, uh, Mars has, as far as we know, not uh, run further than to here. Uh, this is stromatolites. They are uh, bacteria that uh, uh, were involved in producing the first atmosphere and the oxygen we have in the atmosphere. Uh, oxygen is toxic to them, so it's a waste product they, they form. If we find something like that on Mars, we'll be thrilled, and maybe that'll be the basis of a Nobel Prize. Anyway, what does life need 
to survive and flourish. What do we need? Water. Yeah, water. Oxygen. We need oxygen, but not all life needs oxygen. In fact, oxygen is a bit toxic. This is why we have these complex blood cells that encapsulate uh, uh, oxygen and uh, hemoglobin. We need something else. Light. Yeah, energy. It could be the sun. It could be something else. Uh, we have the sun. Mars has the sun. Mars is a little bit further out. So the power of the sun is about half that uh, of the power we have on, on Earth, on the surface of Earth. And because it rotates, we have both seasons and uh, days like, uh, like on, on, on uh, the Earth. So we need the sun or some kind of subsurface chemistry and or heat. Uh, you know that there are uh, deep sea vents that uh, support life also. So life does not necessarily need the sun, just needs some kind of energy. And water, some of you said. It also needs organic molecules. We consist of mainly water, but the rest is organic molecules. So these are, for all we know, the necessities of life. Um, we tried looking for it. And in my uh, field of work, this is what we call the Viking Age. For some of you, the Viking Age would be further back. But for me, it's in the 70s. And in the 70s, the Americans sent two big missions to Mars, two landers and two orbiters. And the purpose of these were to detect life. At that time, it was thought uh, that it was probably simple. You could just land some laboratories, check for organics, check for energy consumption and energy exchange, and check for some kind of metabolism. So they brought chicken soup, uh, radioactively labeled, so you could let microorganisms eat this chicken soup, produce uh, some uh, carbon dioxide as a waste product, and then detect this carbon dioxide afterwards. They also brought radioactively labeled carbon dioxide that you could feed for plants, feed plants in the soil if uh, plants were there. It turned out that um, all of these experiments, this is the complex set of experiments, it's uh, about this size, uh, more than 10 kilograms. It was very complex. You don't need to read all this. Just that there were four distinct biology experiments, two for metabolism, one for gas exchange, and one for organics. And uh, three of these were negative, and one was positive. Uh, and that was a bit of a surprise, both that all when, uh, three were negative, and uh, one other surprise was that no organics were found. It's not completely true, and uh, in order to not forget it, I put a small star, because they did find some organic solvents, they thought. It, uh, it, they had chlorine, and if you uh, clean electronics, you usually use some kind of spray with a little bit of uh, chlorine in it, some organic uh, compound with chlorine in it. This was found, it's not uh, necessarily an organic, but it was believed that this was part of the cleaning agents for the instruments before it was launched. And then this positive result could be due to inorganic chemistry. But the guy who designed it and this team, his team still believes that they actually did find microbes at the time, but it's a little bit controversial. Also, uh, Viking found that the Mars soil is oxidizing. And uh, you know what oxidized is. This is what happened to your bikes or, or your uh, cars when they, you leave them in the winter. They uh, corrode and turn reddish. Uh, on Mars, it turns out that if you put water on the soil, you produce oxygen. So this uh, soil is able to split the water and produce a little bit of oxygen. So the soil is not only oxidized, somewhat oxidized, reddish, but it's also oxidizing. And uh, a lot of thought has been gone into this, why is it oxidizing? Could it be some, something with the UV light? The uh, pressure on Mars is only 8 millibars, it's a very thin atmosphere, and that means that we've no ozone layer like on, on Earth that prevents the UV uh, radiation from reaching the surface, so we have intense UV radiation. And it's believed that it, this could form some kind of oxidant, oxidant maybe hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so, these organic uh, molecules, uh, it's, I put a question mark, because uh, they claimed not to have found organic uh, molecules. But maybe some people believe that actually they did find organics. They were just not 
organics uh, as we expected, but they contain some chlorine. Uh, and because I'm a physics nerd interested in dust, people say I have dust on my brain, I studied dust on Mars, and uh, this really started, you'll get a, get a, I'll give you a little bit of background. This started with my uh, colleague, uh, who now unfortunately died, Jens Martin Knudsen. He read everything he could about Mars, and uh, he found this magnetic properties experiment. There's a small soil sampler used to sample material that was put into these experiments for biology, and it had a small magnet, and this magnet attracted soil uh, so it was, it, this was just a gray, clean plate until it was put into the soil. Then when you pulled it out, it had this soil material adhering to it. And here are some images taken from uh, both of these landers. They were very far apart. So the soil in general contains something magnetic. And here are some lab experiments with a copy of this. Uh, this is put into pure hematite. This is uh, what you can scrape off your bike when it's rusty. Uh, this is a... Uh, GAC1 is a um, Mars soil analog. It's very similar in color to the Martian soil. And this one is a soil from Jutland, from a place called Saltenskov. And the truth of this, this is somewhere between these two. Uh, so this tells us about the minerality of the soil. And uh, we believe that studying the minerality of the soil can tell us something about the history of, of water. And I'll try to tell you why. Uh, this is uh, an image of the lander deck of this Viking lander. It had a series of color charts, and in, in one of these, the central one, there was a gray aluminum plate with a ring magnet and a disc magnet embedded in it. So it's just gray. You couldn't see it if it wasn't because it had attracted dust from the atmosphere. So also that both the soil and the dust has some kind of magnetic mineral in it. Uh, and this is a hard fact. Uh, based on uh, imaging of all these, uh, all these data, as days went by, uh, the magnetization of this material has been uh, studied, and the conclusion was that it was probably a mineral called machimide. And it's very closely related to hematite. It's Fe2O3, that's the chemical formula for it, but it has a different structure that makes it slightly magnetic. Uh, but Machimite form under certain conditions, but not under all uh, thinkable conditions. So uh, we started our work on Mars by trying to, we were interested in the history of liquid water on the planet. What influence had liquid water had on the planet? Uh, was it ever abundant on the surface? Uh, did it ever produce uh, or was, was it ever sufficient to supply the conditions necessary for life to evolve? And the reason we uh, got this idea is a little bit, uh, here's a figure, it's very complex, you need not look at the details, but the iron oxide, this is machimide, and this is magnetite, and the hematite is somewhere up here, and there are a lot of pro processes you can imagine transforming one to the other and they can form under special conditions. So whatever we find of these minerals on Mars, they'll tell us about the environmental conditions under which they formed, and this is why the minerals are interesting. And the way, one of the ways to study these minerals is to study what we can collect on magnets. And this is how the Danish group built a career, how to test the idea. Uh, here's... Uh, uh, Images. It's a complete 360 degrees panorama from a mission uh, launched in 1996, landed in 1997 on the 4th of July. Uh, a lot of fireworks. And uh, this mission carried some magnets. And the idea was to use this idea. Here were two magnets of different strength. One of them very strong, collected airborne dust. So if we could send to Mars a series of magnets, some of which were so weak so they may not be able to hold and attract the magnetic dust. We'll know how magnetic it was, and that was the idea behind this experiment. So put something with a lot of different magnets, check which one will not be able to attract dust. And uh, 
And this is how they were constructed. And this is a color image from the surface of Mars. And you can see that the two first magnets definitely has attracted something. I don't know if you can see a very faint green here, but this one has also attracted something. And if you, I'm not sure if I have it, I, oh, here it is. If you uh, look at these uh, images at the blue wavelength, uh, all the, what we can see is from 400 to 700 nanometers approximately. And if you look at how, how the spectrum of mass is in this wavelength range, it's bright, sort of bright in the red end of the spectrum, but it's very dark in the blue end of the spectrum. So a lot of red light is reflected, but very little blue light is reflected, and this is why Mars is reddish. Uh, so if you look in the blue end, where these aluminum plates are very bright, you can have a very dark contrast from just a very little uh, amount of dust. So this is how we could see very clearly that even on magnet number four, we have a weak ring of dust. And this told us that the uh, magnetization of dust, we, we didn't become very much more clever than we were before because it's almost the same numbers as on the previous mission. Uh, but it, is, it reflects a distribution. Some of the dust is relatively strongly magnetic, maybe 10, 15 in this uh, scale, but there's very, very little of it. So uh, we learned something about the magnetization of the dust but a lot of questions remained. From this information alone, we couldn't tell which mineral uh, made up the magnetic uh, phase in the dust. And because of that, we couldn't tell how it was formed. And therefore, we couldn't say much about the role of water. Uh, we, don't, we don't know how small the particles are. We know a little bit because we measured towards the sun when light scatters from the sun in all these dust particles suspended in the atmosphere, we can use the way the intensity uh, falls off when you look away from the sun, we can use that to measure the particle size. And that tells us that the particle size is at most three micrometers. And we could also see that almost everywhere we looked at dust, something that had been airborne, it had almost the same color. And this led us to assume that all the particles uh, all the particles were more or less composite. I think it was here, even the smallest airborne particles se seem to be composite in nature. And composite bit means that they, each little grain consists of several crystallites. So there more, there's more than one mineral in each of these small three micrometer big particles. So that was our conclusion at the time. Uh, again, we couldn't say much about water. We couldn't say anything about organics. Uh, but then in 2001, an orbiter would pu was put into orbit. It was called Mars Odyssey. And it measured both gamma rays produced by cosmic radiation uh, hitting the surface. So we could see gamma rays from hydrogen. And they, were, uh, they have a speci special energy, so we know they're from hydrogen. We could also see neutrons that were uh, tempered. They were slowed down by hitting hydrogen or carbon in the surface. And... Uh, Based on this, it was an orbiter, so it crosses Mars and Mars rotates beneath it. So you get data from all over the surface. And uh, this is an integrated view of more than one year, more than one time of year. And this shows a high uh, water content, about 100% at the poles. We knew that in advance, that the, the poles of Mars, uh, they have glaciers just like Earth, and they consist mainly of water. But we found that in the top most meter, almost down to uh, 60 or 50 degrees uh, latitude, there was a substantial amount of water in this top surface, maybe as much as 50 percent some places. This is what we know on Earth as permafrost. Even near the equator, there are parts of the surface that has maybe somewhere between 5 or 10 percent of water. Hydrogen, maybe I should say hydrogen, because this is all we know. We think thought it was water, but we, didn't, we hadn't proved it. Uh, this map requires a lot of modeling, a lot of computer analysis, and uh, you should always doubt stuff like that. You need to grab and taste something before you know it's water. So this we wanted to do. Water, yeah, I put an a OK mark here, but a question mark, before, because we know it's hydrogen. 
but some of it could be bound in, in for instance, one of these hydrated oxide I showed you, uh, FeOOH. Uh, if you heat that a little bit, uh, some of these OHs will combine to make H2O, and you'll have Fe2O3 remaining. Uh, but in order to investigate this, NASA sent uh, two rovers called Mars Exploration Rovers. They were sent to Mars in 2003 and landed January 2004. Uh, they had a lot of instruments on board, uh, some spectroscopy cameras, some navigation cameras. They had a robotic arm with a lot of instruments on it, uh, a MIS-power spectrometer. I'll not make you expert in, in experts in MIS-power spectroscopy, but I'll show you some MIS-power spectra. I'll show you not only pictures, but a lot of uh, really hard physics data on the, on the surface, and I'll explain to you what it means. Uh, so there will be MIS-power data, there will be elemental composition data, and that also tells us about the minerality of the dust. Uh, here was a small rock abrasion tool, and then some magnets uh, collecting dust. Uh, and to give you an idea of the size of this creature, these wheels are uh, 30 centimeters, something like this. And if you measure from the ground to this level of the camera, it's uh, one meter and 40 centimeters, so it's sort of like this. They are cute little structures. Uh, they have a wingspan of two and a half meter. Uh, they, uh, the landing sites were carefully selected. There were two different landing sites. One was in what was believed to be an old crater lake. And this is the landing ellipse. I think it was, uh, it's approximately 100 kilometers long. Uh, and what you see here, this is the small image that's big here. You see there's a river, something like an ancient river leading into this crater. And you can see material is leaving it from, from out here. So it's clear that water once flowed, or at least some liquid once flowed into this crater and out again. So we wanted to go there. That was one of the sites. The other sites were, the other side were chosen as a plain, an extremely boring plain, except for one thing, it had hematite. It was shown from orbit that it had hematite. We wanted to go there. And the advantage of a boring plain is that it's safe to land on. Uh, this is a crater. If you land anywhere on a small mountain or on something where uh, these landed with airbags, so they can tumble if they reach uh, something that isn't level. So it's a bit dangerous and risky. We were also told at the time that to land here, these missions were designed to last 90 days if they were close to the equator. This is 12 degrees south of the equator. And because it's a crater, it's a little bit deeper. So we were told by the engineers, don't count on a lifetime of 90 days in this one. Uh, but it was decided uh, by the team that we wanted to go there anyway. We wanted to go to this crater lake. Uh, this mission lasted uh, eight years. Uh, and the other one, Opportunity, is still alive. It's just started its tenth, uh, tenth year. They have some small handicaps, but they still work. This is Spirit's first image before the uh, camera mast is uh, raised. And in a way, this was, it was very exciting and very uh, promising because the landing went well. But it's a boring place. No water, no sign of water. Uh, so for some of us, it was a little bit disappointing. I thought it was almost like the Pathfinder landscape. But the guy who is in charge of the landing site committee says that, that this is completely different. Uh, in Pathfinder, you could see some of the rocks piled up like uh, books in a bookshelf. And that, was, that effect was produced by water. Here, there's no effect produced by water. And for that reason, he found it exciting. Uh, but we did find uh, there are some hills out here, and when we went to these hills, we did find minerals that can only form in water, but that's another story. What I want you to pay attention is here, in, here, in this one is the color. It looks rusty, and it is a little bit rusty. And here's the first mus power spectrum. And a mus power spectrum is uh, it's a nuclear techniques, a technique, so you should imagine you're sitting inside an atom looking out at the electrons, and you're looking at the ways the electrons organize themselves. You look at symmetry, and if the surroundings are perfectly symmetric, you will have only one line in here. The more asymmetric it is, the more 
imbalance there is in the charges you see when you look around you, the more the more is the splitting between the lines. And if something is magnetic, if some of the electrons order their spins so they are not random, randomly oriented, but parallel or anti-parallel to each other, then you'll have six lines in the spectrum. So from inside the atom, you can learn a lot about the electrons out there, and you can uh, learn whether they are participating in, in some collective effect like magnetism. What we learned from this one, this is I'm free plus, this is oxidized iron, and it's less than 40% of the whole spectrum. So these blue and red lines, these are silicates. It's iron in the valence state two, and silicates, these olivine and pyroxene, that's what they are, they are the main components of the earth uh, crust, no, not crust, metal, the, uh, where the convection from uh, internal heating is going on. So this is what uh, is present on the surface of Mars. Some of this material that has been expelled by volcanoes, rocks and dust, olivine and pyroxene, most of the, some of the most primitive uh, minerals we can imagine in a way. And then a little bit of rust. And when it was so reddish, we were a little bit surprised to see that only 40% of it was rust. But this is a fact. This is how it is. The other one, it landed in a small crater, only 20 meters in diameter. So this is the horizon. And here are some rocks that are not only rocks, they are outcrops. It's a uh, bedrock. It's something that has formed where you see it there. So we went to study this, and we saw some... Uh, at first, I should tell you, tell you that this is an orbiter image. It's taken from, an, uh, from a very good camera on Mars Global Surveyor. And uh, what it shows is some of the traces we left. This uh, Mars Global Surveyor has taken lots of images on the surface. So we can compare with images before the landing and images after the landing. And so here's the heat shield, and at the, towards the end, I'll tell you how a mission like this lands and all the garbage it, garbage it produces and brings along. Uh, so heat shield is one of them. Backshell and parachute is another one. And this one landed with airbags, an eight meter diameter airbags, enclosing this small structure with the spacecraft that's uh, about my size. So it was embedded in this eight meter air, airbags. Oops. And, uh, so these are some of the bounce marks. And then it found its way into this small crater. It's incredible, isn't it? 20 meter crater and it just finds its way there. Uh, the boss of the mission, Steve Squires, he called this an interplanetary hole in one. <laughs> so you can be lucky. And this is, we found a rock with a lot of these small pearls in it. And uh, remember uh, this, Landing site, this was the other one, it was chosen because we could see hematite, the mineral hematite, from orbiters. And we wanted to study these small pearls. Uh, this rock looks a little bit reddish, and this is what hematite usually look, looks like. But some of you may know uh, bloodstone, a black uh, rock, it's actually hematite. It's black until you if you crush it under a, a sink or something, some hard porcelain, you, it'll produce a red streak. So this is the powder. So even this black rock can produce red powder if you work on it. So this is a measurement using the Mersbauer spectrometer. In order to do a good measurement, we want to do a reference measurement. So we brushed a little part of the rock. This part is 36 millimeters in diameter. And the, these small pearls are the size of peppercorns. So you should imagine peppercorns lying on the surface. Uh, so we made one measurement here, another one 68 millimeters to the right of it, uh, and this produced these spectra. So this blue part is six lines of hematite, and then some lines from olivine and pyroxene that you saw before. So this olivine and pyroxene is from the dark uh, dust in here, and these magnetic lines are the most power spectrum of hematite. So, to our surprise, it turned out that these small peppercorns are actually hematite, and they are formed by groundwater penetrating this rock, uh, and it is assumed, uh, calculated by the volume of these small uh, spheres that are everywhere, some of them are built into the, the rock, 
that about 70 meters of this rock has eroded down to produce all the berries that lie there, all these small peppercorns. The rest of it, the yellow spectrum, is a little bit of hematite, and this is red hematite. It has a slightly smaller field, and these uh, lines are asymmetric to the inside. And there's a doublet here that is a potassium iron sulfate that's hydrated. So if you take a little bit of this ye uh, yellow rock and put it into a kettle, you can boil it and get a half a cup of tea. So there's water in it, and this mineral forms in water when it turns uh, acidic and more and more dry, then you can form this, it's called gyrocide. Uh, but we wanted to study dust, and on these, uh, this is dust devils, uh, just like you see them in uh, earth deserts, but just much larger. These can be almost a kilometer high, and uh, up to seven meters in, in uh, diameter at the base, and they move at typically five uh, meters per second across the surface. And, uh, the longer these uh, missions have run, the better the software has been developed to detect them. So now we don't need to look for them ourselves. The robot looks for them itself and uh, sends it down if uh, there's something interesting. Otherwise it doesn't, we don't need, need to bother looking at it. But we're interested in dust, and for the dust I showed you the magnets. Um, these are the main magnets just in front of the camera mast. And out here is a color calibration target. And uh, this is made because these color cameras are extremely primitive. They, make, they measure one wavelength at a time, and then based on all these wavelengths, we make a superposition, and from this, we can do a color image. You can, in principle, you can do it by just three colors, but it turns out it's much better if we use all the, all the data we have, just like in quantum mechanics. Uh, so this is the clean, uh, the clean calibration target. You can see there's something blue, something green. This is uh, chromium oxide, and this is a cobalt oxide. This is goethite, and this is hematite, some oxides, embedded in a uh, rubber, in a synthetic rubber, something like, uh, like your uh, soles uh, on the shoes. And this is uh, sol numbers 10, 416, 417, and 711. And what you can see from this is that uh, this one gets dusty with time, and you don't see the colors very much on this one, uh, except this small magnet. This was made to answer one of, the, one of the questions we couldn't answer by the Pathfinder data. We wanted to know how much of the dust is non-magnetic, and you couldn't, uh, you, maybe you wonder why you can use a magnet to find non-magnetic dust. But the point is that you, if you have a very strong ring magnet. This is embedded in this gray uh, uh, matte surface, aluminum. This ring magnet is extremely powerful. So if you have dust falling down or passing by this magnet, if these <coughs> dust particles are just a little bit magnetic, they'll be caught by, by the magnet. And only dust particles that don't interact with the magnet will be able to reach the center, the center uh, plate of this magnet, and you can see this center is very bright in this one, and in fact we had to readjust the exposure times of this because it was so clean. It was, the engineer said this is the cleanest place on Mars, and there are two of them, there's one on Spirit and one on Opportunity. So there are two clean places on Mars, and then we, you can see it's a little bit dustier, the rim and clean in the center, and this means that almost all the particles blowing around in the Martian atmosphere, they are magnetic to some degree. Otherwise, this would not have been so clean. Uh, then we had a wind gust the day after. So this is much, much cleaner than here. Now you can start seeing the colors again. You can see that this is almost clean everywhere in, except where the magnet has attracted dust. Uh, and then it gets dusty again. And because of this, we were asked to provide a new type of uh, color calibration targets to the next lander. And it was uh, Phoenix and it landed in 2008. And uh, this is just some, this is the magnets again, some dynamics, you can see it's dusty, then some of the dust is removed, it turns brownish, and then reddish again, brownish and reddish. And uh, these are some of the instruments of the arm, looking at it, this is a microscope looking at the magnet, and we can see that after a wind gust, some of the m most magnetic particles are concentrated between the magnets. Uh, and this gives some information about 
the, uh, the, the uh, dust, and we can use these instruments. And now, again, I have to show you a mist power spectrum. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a bit nerdy, but uh, this, it shows magnetite. And then some of these minerals we saw before. Um, there's something in the center, we don't know what it is. This is this, uh, this oxidized iron that makes it red. And, but now, since this is magnetite, now we know why the dust is magnetic. Magnetite is a magnetic mineral. So this is the reason. Uh, this is, uh, again, some wiggly lines. The titanium follows the iron, and the chromium follows the iron. And this shows that this magnetite has nothing to do with water. It's just rocks that are falling apart because the temperature has been fluctuating. So it's rocks that has turned into powder, and this is what we see. Uh, there's one thing we don't know what is, and this is what uh, we, I'll tell you a little bit later. I hope I can do a little bit faster but because <laughs> I'm running out of time. But this is uh, the, what we proposed for an investigation of Curiosity Mars Science Lab. Uh, so now we know why it's magnetic. It's because of the uh, magnetite has nothing to do with water. And then Phoenix, that's the mission you he heard initially, it found water. And I'll show you the original results, how it found water. Uh, it took a while, fifth, almost 60 days on the surface. It turned out to be very difficult. And we were punked by NASA headquarters to get speedy on this and try to, try to do it. Uh, so we drilled a little bit of powder. We couldn't dig anything up. It turned out that there were ice down here. We could see in the bottom of the trench there were ice, but we couldn't scoop it. We couldn't put it into the uh, small analyzer. Uh, and here's one of the reasons why we turned it, uh, eventually we drilled out a little bit of sample that we could sprinkle down and the wind took some of it, so we didn't even get all of it. Uh, but we got something into the oven, and this small oven is a small twin oven, and uh, it's heated in a way, uh, the, the oven has a hole so you can put sample in one branch of it, but not in the other. And when you heat it, what you do is you measure the power that's needed to keep the temperature constant in this. So when you heat it, and there's some, say, water in this one, you will need extra power to transform this water into vapor. Just like when you boil a kettle of water, you can put all the power in under it you need, but it'll still not reach a temperature more than 100 degrees centigrade at this pressure. At the mass pressure, it'll reach 16 centigrade before it uh, boils off. So this is the power, this is the proof. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> it's really a, a physics curve. But what it shows is that you need more power in one of these branches than in the other to make the temperatures rise at the same uh, speed. So this is the power you need to evaporate the water there. This is not much, so, but there's a little bit of water. And this, from this we can say we've tasted the water. It's really water and not just hydrogen or some exotic thing. This is water water ice. And this is the calibration target. I'll not yet dwell much on these. Just show that they get dusty, but the center remains clean. Uh, and we produce three of the, those in Denmark for this mission. Uh, also, this mission, because of it has some wet chemistry analyzers, we found what the oxidant is, and that was really a surprise. And it took a little bit of ingenuity, because no instruments on this one were made for it. But one of the sensors behaved very strangely. And looking up at the internet, what could cause this strange behavior, the explanation was perchlorate. And the perchlorate, uh, maybe it's an oxidant, uh, not very violent at low temperatures, but it's used in rocket fuels and in fireworks. And it constitutes about 1% of the Martian soil. So you do have rocket fuel there if needed for solid state rockets. So uh, again, we have proven now there's water. No doubt about it, it's uh, water ice. Organic molecules, we don't know. And the reason is that we had an oven to produce it, to check for this uh, organic molecules. And the problem with perchlorate is that once you heat it, it destroys organics. So we know now that if there had been organics, it would have been destroyed when we measured it. But we don't know what to do about it. We couldn't do it in this mission. So that's the next mission. Uh, one, one more thing. We found that in, it had a microscope, and we found that the color is indeed in the dust. The largest grains, the magnetic grains, are dark in this one. All that remains 
is uh, what we proposed for, for our investigation in Mars Science Lab. Uh, this I'll just uh, jump through. Uh, so Mars Science Lab, evaluate biological potential. That's what we're going for, looking for habitability. Is it possible for microbes to have lived in an environment that was wet a long time ago? And uh, this is Gale Crater, 150 kilometers across. It has a five kilometer high uh, mountain in the base. And here you can hardly see there's a small ellipse. And this is the most probable landing site. And um, once we came down, at uh, first, I should say, it's a big structure. Uh, Viking was 600 kilograms. Mars Pathfinder was 250 plus a rover. Uh, Phoenix was 300 kilograms approximately. All of these rovers were each 185. Uh, but curiosity, because all of the stuff we want to do with it, it has 80 kilograms of scientific instruments. And for that, you, and you, when you need mobility, it's about 900 kilograms. And you need three tons of infrastructure to make it land. And I'll show you how later. One more thing that's needed is a development of technology, because you need a very small landing ellipse. These are the different landing ellipses from all the previous missions, and they don't fit in. You cannot land one of the, with one of the old techniques in this crater. You need it to develop something new. Uh, this is about the size of it. It's 2.2 meters high, 2.8 meters wide, and a bit more than 3 meters long. It has a lot of instruments, and I'll show you some of the results from this. The, some of the most important ones are the uh, X-ray diffractometer. It can investigate minerals not only iron-containing minerals at the most power as the most power spectrometer, but all minerals, as long as they're crystalline. Uh, and then SAM can analyze chemical and isotopic composition, including organic compounds, and it has the tools to do it without heating the material. So even if there are perchlorates in this material, we should be able to find organics. Uh, this is the first image from one of the HAS camps. It's a bit grainy, it had a dust cover, uh, nevertheless, the mission manager called this the most beautiful image he had ever seen on Mars because he was so happy that it made it to the surface. Uh, this is the image after it removed the dust cover and here we can already see the, the mound. And it, these images may not, not look much to you, but if you are there exploring one of the last, or one of the, there's still a lot of white areas on the map on Mars, but nobody had ever seen anything like this before. So it's kind of a privilege to be there and receive these data as one of the first on, on the Earth. Uh, this is uh, just a map of the landing ellipse illustrating all the work that had been going on by a geologist. All of these small squares has a name. And uh, Dawn Sumner, who uh, had been working with two of these squares, she was at a press conference and she told us that we've landed in Area 51 and she didn't understand why people were so amused. <laughs> Some of you will know. Uh, looking north, you could see across the crater rim, you can see something looking like rivers coming down from a big area up here. There's a huge area there that can collect water. And if you look at the geology, this is the uh, trip we are going. This is the uh, landing site where the dust has been blown off. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I just have a sip of this. Mm. Ah. It'll be your turn. <laughs> um, anyway, if you, one of the results of this careful mapping was that as an outflow of this river, Peace Valleys, we named it, is a big alluvial fan. And if you have been traveling in deserts, you can see that wherever water has been running down the mountains, there'll be a lot of debris and uh, gravel that has pour over a, uh, been poured over a wide area. So this is the way water has been transported down here. And then one of the guys at the, at the, uh, on the team, he found that this place and this place were probably one of the lowest areas in the crater. So he wanted us to go there instead of heading straight for, uh, that was the, here it is, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd better find the right place again. Instead of heading for the mount, that was what we were told to do by NASA headquarters. And that was how the mission was proposed, to go towards the mount. And the reason the mount was so interesting 
was that we had found uh, what happened? We had found some minerals there that can only form in plenty of water. Um, don't be scared of the number of slides. I'll uh, skip through these relatively fast, as fast as I can. Uh, but at these lower edges of the mountain, we had found phyllosilicates and sulfates, uh, minerals that can only form in lots of water. They are formed by precipitation in water. A long time ago, 3.2 to 3.7 billion years ago, a very long time ago. Uh, and uh, because, of, because of this, uh, we know water has one been, once been there. The places lowest in this crater would be where we would find the most recent traces of this water. And for this reason, we wanted to go there. And uh, I'll just show you a few images from the way over there. This is uh, rocks just close to the landing site. They've been blown clean of dust, uh, like this. This is how it happened. Uh, here we found, again, rocks that pops out of the ground. They are formed in place. And uh, this, what do you think it looks like? Concrete. It is like concrete, isn't it? It's uh, small pebbles, more or less uh, joined together in something like concrete. Some of the team members, uh, we went on field trips looking at the uh, landscape like this, and we found a bridge, and one of the guys photographed this concrete of the bridge because it looked very much like this. Uh, but the point of it is, uh, if you look at this rock, for instance, this one, it's smooth and rounded. You cannot do that by wind. It's like a, a rock you find at the beach. Uh, and this one is even flat. It's like a skipping stone. Here's an enlargement of it. This one. And all of these are more or less rounded. We never saw stuff like that on Mars before. This is, this is, this is flown in, these have flown in a river. Just like we would have imagined in this uh, alluvial fan. Uh, two of uh, the young guys on my team have been measuring out carefully all these small round rocks and uh, their first paper will be a paper in science, we hope. It's just submitted um, as a result of, of uh, a lot of work. Initially, when I presented this type of work for them, they thought it would be a little bit boring. But once they uh, thought about the implications that you could see how the water had flowed by exactly uh, investigating these small rocks in the surface, uh, they caught an interest in it. And this is a comparison from the picture on Mars and one in the Atacama Desert. In this desert, you have uh, negative rivers, in a way, rivers standing out of the landscape because, because of the fine material these uh, rocks have, uh, have moved. They are cemented together, so everything else in the desert erodes down faster than the river. So the river stands above the surface, and you can see it as a negative, kind of a negative riverbed. And uh, this we can see on Mars, too. So I'm pushing the wrong buttons because I'm in a, in a hurry. This is another outcrop. Uh, they also did a lot of work on that, and it'll be included in one of the next papers. Uh, because this uh, rover had a lot of complex uh, instruments inside, we wanted to make sure that whatever samples we presented to these instruments would be free of earth contaminants. So we wanted to find some loose soil, just like the one on the floor, and then enter some of this into the uh, uh, handling instrument, shake it very well, dump it out, another sample, shake it, dump it out, and then the third sample we would put into uh, these instruments. The first one is the X-ray diffractometer. It has a tube. It's just like when you go to the dentist. There's a radiation. There's a sample. This is your teeth. And then there's a film you put in there. Uh, so you get spectra like this, and this tells you what minerals are present. And um, we took these five samples. The third one was put into Kimin, and the two last ones were put into both Kimin, the X-ray diffractometer, and SAM to look for organics. Uh, this is just to show the difference between the images as they appear in the margin, dusty margin atmosphere. It gives a reddish tint to it. But because of this calibration target we have along, we can calibrate the colors and make them just as it would have been if we were without the atmosphere, without the dust in the atmosphere. This is how the landscape would look on Earth in, uh, in our sun. 
This is the results. Again, a little bit nerdy. It's the first X-ray diffractogram from another planet. Uh, it shows that uh, this, uh, this soil contains placoclase, two types of, again, pyroxene, olivine, some iron oxides, and an amorphous component. And this amorphous component, we are two teams who proposed uh, why Mars has the color it has. One team says it's because of an amorphous component, and they're probably right, so I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still looking for it. There may be a small component, and there may be a trace of water. Never mind, we're working on these skipping stones right now, and there are lots of other work to do. So we'll have, uh, we have plenty of work to do anyway. Uh, this is the lowest area as we saw it when we approached it. This is a place we called diving board initially because we thought it was a meter high or two meters high, something you would dive from. But when the rover got there, it's about the size of one of its wheels. This is uh, this size, 50 centimeters or so. It's a bigger, bigger rover, but we are always cheated by the way the landscape looks. Uh, this is one of the. Uh, this is again a panorama uh, showing that there's a layer that's a bit higher, and then there's this uh, yellow knife bay, a little bit lower lying area. And here's something that, to me, when I saw it the first time, it looked like a dried up river bed or you no know, a lake, a dried out lake. Uh, there's, we've been in some of the field trips, we've seen lakes like that on Mars, uh, and this is how it looks. I thought it was just a kind of clay or soil crumbling up, but it turns out, if you look at it very closely, it's not crumbling up, but it's hard pieces of mineral that stand out of the rock and erode slower than the rest of it. It seems to be gypsum, and those of you who know gypsum, it's not extremely hard, you can scratch it by a knife but still it erodes slower than the surrounding, surrounding rock. We haven't proven yet that it's gypsum. We are trying to do it. Uh, this is a drill site we selected to drill. Here we investigated the elemental composition and here we polished some of the surface. And here again the red, uh, just a pressure in the surface to measure how hard it is. And uh, here the drilling is going on. So this happened. This happened some weeks ago now. Uh, we drilled two holes, one uh, 1.6 millimeters deep, 1.6 millimeters in diameter, the other one 62 millimeters, and there's not enough dust here that it can account from, for this hole. So fortunately, we succeeded. Here's the drill, and it has a kind of a turbo pump here that can extract some of the dust and put it into a complex apparatus that can treat this dust, sieve it, pick out the particle sizes we want. That's part of the apparatus in here. And then it can give it back into a scoop. This scoop we can use both to look at the material or we can scoop up some new material. And this reddish material is what we scooped out before in rockness soil. This is what we drilled out of the rock. And you will all notice it has a different color. Is this oxidized? No. Maybe it has organics. It, uh, when it's not oxidized, the reason could be organics. Now we have put it into the instruments up here. This is a self-portrait, by the way, taken the same way you would take self-portraits with your cell phone. Uh, it has a, or a, a microscope, sort of microscope a scope it can tear out like this. And this is a panorama of lots of these images. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we, have not, we are not done with it. This, we hope we can get the answer of, of about the organic molecules. We hope we can get, uh, get an answer whether this is sol uh, a sulfate or gypsum. Uh, but unfortunately, we suffered a computer glitch, so uh, we lost the contact with one branch of the computers on the 28th of February. Now they are switching gradually to the uh, other branch of the computer, and it seems to work but it takes a lot of time, it takes at least a week to regain control of all the instruments on board. Uh, so, uh, it'll take a while. <laughs> we'll have to be patient. Uh, one of the guys on this mission said its middle name is Patience, and we have to live with that. It's half a year since we landed now, and we're getting impatient. When we have analyzed this, we have to go to Mount Sharp. This is a requirement uh, from NASA headquarters, and we are all very curious to get there. Um, so this is uh, it's, it's a little bit loud, but this is illustrating how how the landing takes place. Maybe I should. Can you turn it down a little bit? 
Thank you. That's a very natural thing. These are, this is the lead engineer for the entry, descent, and landing. Oh, you can hear what it says. It looks crazy, but it does make sense. From the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag, our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun, 1,600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9 Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground, because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane a little bit. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. So you see, it's very complex. Uh, and uh, well, well, fortunately, it was successful. And now you can land 
units of about one ton on the surface. And that's what's required to bring humans there. We need some infrastructure. We need a small nuclear reactor. We need somewhere to live in. And you can bring that down in units of about a ton. Uh, and concerning this question, we don't know yet. Uh, but I hope it, this is the, from, from Big Bang, this is the Skabelsesberetning. That's how everything was uh, uh, made, according to our belief. So this is the first atoms that find together. Here you find, uh, here a, form, a solar system is formed and complex molecules in space. And eventually, at least on one planet, we have formed this beautiful structure. This is DNA. Uh, we don't know whether it's formed somewhere else, but this is what we're looking for. So that's why I hope I'll con I've convinced you. And thank you very much for your patience. I'm sure I went a bit old. <laughs> thank you for this presentation, Martin. Uh, we have time for two or three questions before we take a break. There's a question just here.